so far. We're looking forward to adding to that, that, that track record so far. As Marty said, we're going to be speaking on hedge fund alpha. So we're going to be, this panel is going to be talking a lot about investor appetites for, for hedge funds right now, where you can find alpha, where you can lose it, how to diligence uh, the hedge fund area, fiduciary rule, and more. So looking forward to this conversation. Uh, over here, we have Suzanne Murphy. They're all, almost sitting in order here. She is managing director of Lamp Conway. Sitting next to her is Mark Jennings, who is managing director and head of capital introductions for Plate Investments. And sitting to my left is Mitch Holt of Cloud. Uh, what's that? Hybrid account. Hybrid account. Great. Uh, who's gen managing general partner with Hybrid Endowment. Uh, my name is Mark Hyde. I'll be moderating this. I'm with, I'm a managing director of Pickwick Capital Partners, and we're registered a middle market advisor to middle market companies and alternative funds. So uh, we look forward to having this conversation. Now, yesterday during our prep call, and I never had this happen before, but Mark goes, so how are we going to run the panel? I said, well, we're going to take questions from the audience as we go, blah, blah, blah. So it goes, it's full on WWE here. <laughs> cage match. We, we are in for the cage match here. So <laughs> feel free at any time to chime in. The only thing I'm going to ask is, you know, time is precious. So make your questions to the point. If we need more, um, if, if we need a little background or anything, we'll ask for it. So feel free to do that. Um, information today is, um, is presented here for educational purposes only, and is not intended as and may not be relied upon as tax, legal, investment, or other advice. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> to the extent myself or our other panelists express an opinion as part of this discussion is our opinion alone and not necessarily those of their firm. So with that, let's have the introduction. Suzanne, would you kick us off? Sure. Suzanne Murphy, Managing Director with Lampy Conway. We are um, raising a, a new a re a relaunch of a fund that we ran from 99 to 2013, the lower middle market special sits event driven and distress space. Uh, I also have my own family office, as my accountant informed me yesterday, why you need to have 60 K1s. Um, but I do. So um, I'm kind of an experienced investor in alternatives and hedge funds across the board. So I think I can speak from both uh, being a partner at a hedge fund and being an investor in hedge funds. And you know the correct answer to that question. So your child can go to college, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Mark? Sure. He, his um, argument was I should just have fewer of them. Like it's okay that I have them. He just doesn't want 60. <laughs> uh, Mark Jennings, managing director, head of cap introductions for Bite Investments. Uh, we're a global premium alternative platform that aggregates small investors together, end-to-end kind of -end white label tech solution. Uh, we are spin out of our placement business that raised money for venture capital, private equity, real estate, hedge funds, infrastructure funds, core endowments, pensions, um, hedge funds, real estate funds, uh, infrastructure funds, and companies. And uh, I've worked at Berger's firm, Blackstone, GSO Hybrid, Alliance Bernstein, Bank of New York. So happy to answer any questions. And I think you missed the stress. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Everything and anything. We're generous. So. Mitch? Um, yeah, I'm Mitch Hall, and I have a firm called Hybrid Endowment Management. Uh, and for 28 years, I've been running a boarding school endowment, co, co steering a boarding school endowment, along with another foundation. Um, and we've done all sorts of investments and in alternatives. Uh, I personally have um, run a convertible art hedge fund. I did for about 12 years, and then I ran a single strategy uh, fund of funds uh, in the pipe space. Um, my hair used to be really dark, like yours, and uh, <laughs> that drove me crazy a little bit. Um, and then I now run a, uh, a couple products, but uh, in a hedge fund uh, space. We have a fund of funds for all short equity. Excellent. Excellent. So with that, let's get into our, our program, and uh, we'll start off with uh, Bobby Jane recently announced, he's the former Credit Suisse Millennium Trust person, uh, that he was raising a new giant global fund with a target of $8 to $10 billion. Now, he's downsized that sum a little bit to 5 or $6 billion, but still fairly impressive size for a first-time fund. So my question to the panel are, is this meaning hedge funds are back now? Which funds are back, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
you know, I, I take umbrage to hedge funds being gone or back or hedge funds have been around forever. Right. And I think, as I said on the call that we, the prep call we had, it's a structure, not a strategy. Right. And so um, I think people look, you know, you have to understand what the manager is investing in to decide whether or not you want to be invested in it. It doesn't really matter if it's private equity, hedge funds, long only. I mean, it's, it's what you want to be invested in. So, I mean, I, I think that in, in the case of Bobby Jane, um, you know, multi-strat is definitely flavor of the month, right? And Izzy Englander is too big and his son is starting something, but people don't think that the son is as good as the father. And so Bobby has the opportunity to enter to the Baliazni, the millennium. You know, it, that's what large institutions want. Um, me personally, I like nichier, smaller strategies, uh, you know, that are, that are more effective, particularly for high net worth individuals. Yeah, I mean, multi-strats are not particularly tax efficient, nor are they uh, high net worth friendly. Well, it, it's a strategy, right? So it's a strategy that's been out of favor for, you know, about a decade now, but I think now with the volatility and the strategy, it's, it's something that is coming back in favor, right? They're looking for something different. And to Susan's point, you know, something more niche, something built around what the client or the investor wants, whether it's high net worth retail or institutional, that's what seems to be the flavor of the month. Yeah, I would, I would just add to that that hedge funds, as we all know, do hedge, are supposed to hedge. Um, mm -hmm. And we went through a period of close to zero interest rates for over a decade. And that was a period where liquidity was flooding into markets. And if you were carrying a short balance, that was pretty difficult in that environment. Um, now rates have normalized and I think we're entering a period that could be, uh, could be more attractive like it was in the first 10 years from 2000 to 2010. Suzanne's whole body shifted over this way and you said rates have normalized. Did you wanna comment on that? Uh, no, I mean, look, I think that the fact that, you know, rates stayed at zero for a decade, um, you know, it looked like things were going to turn pre-COVID and then the government flooded the system with liquidity because they quote unquote had to, um, I, you know, we are definitely, and I am definitely in the case of higher for longer. Um, I don't think the Fed is going to have the ability to cut, despite what somebody said in one of the earlier panels, you know, that if Biden calls up and says, you know, it's pre-election, you know, cut. You know, the Fed doesn't operate that way. And, you know, inflation data and everything's telling us that um, rates need to, in my opinion, need to stay high, which creates volatility and creates opportunity on the short side because of the rebate factor. Um, but look, hedge funds need volatility. And we've had, if you look at the VIX over the last decade, when interest rates were so low, it was pretty benign. And that makes it hard to differentiate yourself, right? Things are either going up or they're going down. There's not the disparity, this dispersion rather, that you need for hedge fund managers or people with more arrows in their quiver to differentiate themselves. And I think we are entering a period where there's going to be increased volatility, there's increased uncertainty, and it's going to create opportunity for those who can take advantage of it. Sure, sure. So hedge funds are about a $3.4 trillion industry. Uh, last year, investors pulled out of the industry about $75 billion. The year before, $112 billion. So will this be 2024 be the year where actually more money goes into hedge funds than goes out? What do you think? I believe so. You know, I think that people are looking for non-correlated risk. They're looking for managed futures or they're looking for something that, you know, can be different than what they've been investing in uh, traditionally with the low rates, with the no volatility. So I do think that you'll see an uptick in allocations to hedge funds this year. I mean, I, I would add that, you know, that we all know that um, zero rates have caused lots of things. One thing it did do was create a lot of companies that have never earned money to kind of stay alive. And I think now we're in a period where some of that debt is coming due. Uh, it's great, they're, they're looking at much higher costs to operate their business. Some are actually going to be faced with closing the door. I think this is a huge opportunity for the trust. And just to add to that, you know, I think that you're seeing more retail investors, RAs, broker dealers, small hire family offices getting access to alternatives. So getting access to hedge funds that normally traditionally they wouldn't, that more endowments or pensions or family offices had access to. So you do see an influx of that allocation as well. 
Sure. And, and I would just add to Mitch's point about these, there are going to be haves and have nots, right? And these smaller companies that have been able to kick the can down the road, you know, you can buy a lot more house at 1% than you can at five and a half. And a lot of what's been issued, particularly for smaller companies in the last decade is floating rate 144A. And so those chickens are going to come home to roost. And if you combine that with the fact that the regional banks are hamstrung, as we all know from you know SVB being the tip of the iceberg and Basel and Game next summer, these companies are really uh, in trouble. And private lending, which has been you know which has had such a great proliferation over the last number of years, is going to have a vintage problem, right? Because unlike private equity, which are seven to ten year structures, uh, private credit tends to be three to five years. You're coming up against a lot of those maturities, a lot of those um, loans have not been underwritten very well, in my opinion. Um, I happen to believe that this is going to be a terrific vintage for private credit because of the regional bank problems and Basel Endgame. But the previous vintages are going to have some real trouble, and you're going to see those things need, need to be worked out, and that's going to create a lot of opportunity. And hey, Morgan, can you guys throw down a little bit more into those have and have not companies? Mish, like what, what's a strategy outside of private credit that you might think might work? As a result of that, well, I think or? our strategy will work. <laughs> but you're, you're <laughs> we're not private credit. Okay. No, no, no. We we invest through QSIP securities. So we're looking at the cap stack, trying to find what we believe is the fulcrum and take effectively a blocking position where we have enough leverage over the process, but not control so we don't get restricted. Right. So, I mean, there's an article about how there's a lot more carve outs now because cost of capital has gone up and so non performing units inside the companies have to be jettisoned. And any, you know, maybe you can expand on that or. Your yeah, thoughts I think they're just across the board in, in almost every industry. Um, there is some in biotech too. We know that, uh, um, and I think that these companies, you know, the biotech industry got really overpriced, and it's had a giant correction. So it's really interesting right now. But the reason why it got so overpriced was any company could just about raise capital in the environment we've been through, and that is now severely ended. Um, so. It's going to be a big separation from the winners and losers in biotech. I love biotech longshore managers. So what's the play? Um, what's the play is to find to find the winners and, and <laughs> short, you know, short the companies that have constantly need capital. There's just a long run to get to where they need to. Um, and to look for weak management teams. Um, look for some fraudulent stories that are out there. Um, and um, kind of put all those into a basket, a short basket, and, and try to pick the winners. I think it's more about the strategy, right? Whether it's a quant strategy or it's a short strategy, you know, event driven. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of interesting strategies out there, Merge ARB. So, you know, I think it's picking the, the strategies that you think fit in your portfolio and in your pipe that's not in there right now that can add value. You know, once the volatility does pick up, what's going to be the, you know, rising in your portfolio that all well, everything else is, is going down. So you think maybe some high flyers might be forced into merger or something like that? Absolutely. I mean, it's the biggest description. Mean, if you if you look at the market and it's really being driven by the Magnificent Seven, right? And you look at the statistics, you're seeing the biggest discrepancy in decades between okay. companies that are, you know, the smaller non, you know, and, and the seven names that are driving the market. I mean, there's a lot of companies with a lot of problems and the market is sort of obfuscating that at the moment to the public side. But if you dig down, there, there are real problems. You mentioned regional banks, which obviously interest rates higher, it's not good for them. You know, then don't even get into the commercial real estate um, bubble, so to speak. So I'm sure that's on the list of next topics to talk about. <laughs> Well, I didn't go down specific topics. I, I let you guys bring those out, but that's a great point. I wanted to talk about some more areas that you think like, might be bubbling or, or having some difficulties. I mean, well, I was just going to add to something somebody else said earlier about, you know, different opportunities and different strategies. I mean, I think the real, for, from an investor's perspective, I mean, A, you want diversification, right? And diversification needs to be meaningful. You can have 15 managers if they're all doing the same thing you don't have real diversification. So in doing due diligence, you have to drill down and understand what, what managers are doing. Um, I think it is going to be, and I, and I hear this from guys running larger funds, um, you know, the, the, just picking the distressed world for example, you look at the canyons, the Apollos, the, uh, 
oak trees, right? They're all chasing the same deals because they have to, and there aren't that many of those. There's going to be a lot more opportunity, you know, lower in the food chain for smaller, more nimble managers who are not competing against each other. I mean, you talk to Josh Friedman at Canyon, he's like, yeah, I'm fighting with Mark Lazary, I'm fighting with John Zito. You know, we're all paying too much uh, because we have to have big enough deals to move the needle for us. Um, I think smaller managers have the ability to uh, be more nimble and take advantage of opportunities that the, that the big guys are kind of reverting to the mean. And the big guys so I think you're going to have to do work yeah. here. I mean, I think that's going to be where you really see alpha is by doing the work, finding the under radar, you know, under the radar managers who are, you know, not so mainstream. What would you consider um, the smaller guys, AUM, like under a billion or under five? You know, I think it really depends on the strategy, right? I mean, you know, in, in terms of where they're deploying capital, I mean, certain strategies could have 2 billion and still be doing things that other folks are not. Other guys should be sub 500 million. I mean, I think you really have to differentiate in terms of, of the strategy. I mean, you know, the fund that we're raising, we want to start with 100. We think we have capacity of easily a billion. We were there the last time we did this um, and we think the market's bigger, but you know we're gonna grow with the opportunity set, right? We don't wanna like force ourselves to put out money. Um, and you know, in, in, again, in distress land, I mean, there's a lot of conversation that a lot of money was raised pre COVID. Um, a lot of money was raised in the falling knife trade of 2015. That money never got put out. So you've got people sitting there going like, I allocated this money to these managers and they never did anything with it. I mean, I know a family office that gave $200 million in a separately managed account to a distressed manager in the COVID falling knife trade. It ended in six weeks. They changed the mandate of the SMA because they could and they had a relationship with the manager. They knew them to be a more sort of traditional credit strategy um, because they just couldn't put the money out in what the original mandate was. Right. And the big funds have to go in in size for all the positions, right? They can't sit on cash, so they have to display it. Whereas some of the smaller funds, you know, we see even the sub hundred million dollar funds or the billion dollar sub uh, you know funds are huge opportunities because they can do things the bigger funds can't, right? And they can kind of bob and weave, as you mentioned, with the SMAs, you know, change the strategy midstream and, and be able to you know do what the client needs or the client wants for their portfolio. Yeah, but those are bigger players, right? The SMAs, they're not your retail investors, so. What you're doing with retail investors, uh, I'm interested because we're speaking about niche strategies here and we're speaking about those being more agile and responsive to the market. Uh, and I'm curious, you know, because typically when I hear RAs putting money in, they like to buy blue chip, right? right. So it seems to me there's a bit of a disconnect. How do you bridge that? Well, I think through technology, through aggregating those small investors, you know, 30% of institutional investors invest in alts, 0.05 with high net credit investors invest in alts. 70% of the advisors don't understand the alts. So by educating the consumer, educating the advisor, by aggregating them together, there's a lot more retail money out there than there is institutional. And by empowering them to be able to have access to niche opportunities that they normally traditionally wouldn't have had if they were coming in individually through an RIA. But you get enough RAs together, and they yield a pretty big stick. Yeah. Oh, without a question. And, and I think that's a good point, right? Like everyone, like if you say to the average retail investor hedge funds, like immediately people go, oh my God, that's risky. Well, guess what? Going back to what I said earlier, it's a structure, not a strategy, right? So is it more risky if you have a long-term technology manager, for example, who is not using leverage in a hedge fund structure? Is that more risky than the Fidelity Technology Mutual Fund that, by the way, A, has to be fully invested, the best they can do is rotate away from the underperforming sectors, whereas the hedge fund guy who's, again, not using leverage in this example, can go short, can sit on cash. And by the way, guys, it's okay for your managers to have cash if that's where they think they need to be. In 2005, when we were running this strategy previously, we were sitting on cash. We had investors saying, you're sitting, we sent back the money. We had a great 06. They all got mad at us. You know, like you can't win for losing, but it's okay for your managers to have cash waiting for the right time. And unfortunately, in long only world, um, you know, you, you don't have that option necessarily. And then I would also add vis-a-vis -vis fees. And we talked about this on our call. Like, it's not a fee. It's a share of profits, right? It goes back to Columbus and Isabella. Isabella had the money. Columbus went out and founded the new world. He got a percentage of the, the profits that he made. And so I think everyone in this room, if you could invest in medallion, in, in Renaissance's medallion fund, you'd pay five and 50 to get those returns. So like, I always tell people like, you give the manager a dollar, focus on what you get back on that dollar. Don't focus on what the manager is making because at the end of the day, 
it's, you know, it's irrelevant and you want managers to be incentivized to make you money. Thereby they make themselves money. And back to your point, you know, if you can whittle these, these retail investors together, they can fight for lower fees because they're together. Right. You know, if all of a sudden you have a hundred people, a hundred thousand, 10 million check the same as 10 million check from retail investors or Harvard endowment. So you but know, again, they, you get what you pay for. You, know, yeah. <laughs> you get what you pay for, but institutional fees are obviously much better than the retail fees. Traditionally, retail investors have to pay. So that's why using technology and aggregating together, you know, you're paying one in seven ten versus three and a half, two and twenty. So you were aggregating them together in SPV and making an investment as a as a unit, or are you yeah, you could do an SPV for an individual company or or a feeder fund into a, a fund as, as one investor. Right, you right. Know, right. fees on top of that, but even with the fees on top of the feeder fund, they're still lower than you going directly traditionally themselves. You walk in without you know less than a million dollar right check to right, getting charged that three and a half, two and twenty. Whether you're at a warehouse going direct or anywhere else, but if you go in with a hundred people, hundred thousand, writing a ten dollar check, obviously the order hundred dollar check, the fees are a lot lower. So that's why technology, I think, and educating the consumer, that's why they normally don't go into this stuff. Right, the fees are too high, the lockups too long. You know, well, the media's perception of the fees again are too high, right? That that 80 20 split on the profits, I'm happy if they're getting 20% and I'm getting 80, you know? <laughs> it's right, a good deal. Susan's point, though, you know, exactly. Susan's type, yeah, sorry. It's not sorry. really a fee, it's a profit share. <laughs> Mitch, uh, one of the things we saw a couple of years ago with these meme stocks, right? And the public got very much into those. Uh, and drove up some prices. And what has been the effect on the inflows and the outflows into the industry in general? It's probably worth a couple minutes to talk about the meme stocks and what, what happened in January of 2021, because I think that's set up an opportunity for hedge funds right this moment. Um, you know, we all remember COVID, of course, and we all remember right after that, restaurants were fairly, most of them were closed. You couldn't really travel too much. You couldn't go to sports events because a lot of them were canceled. You couldn't go to Las Vegas. Um, there wasn't a lot of places to spend your money. And the government was handing out checks to people to stay at home. And I think a lot of, and then social media was certainly there. And that created this incredible perfect storm to, to uh, take these risk dollars that people have and to speculate and they got together and hanged up on short squeezes, which short squeezes have been around for hundreds of years, and that's not gonna go away. But the degree of that is probably really changed. Now you can bet on your phone for who's gonna win the next serve, watch the tennis match, you can, you can go to all these casinos or having record periods of time. You can trap, people are traveling. There's plenty of places to spend your money now. And I think that what that caused was um, a lot of people to leave the industry. There was some really incredible um, short squeezes that hurt some funds. Um, if you look at a chart, 10, 15, 20 year chart of short interest, it's plummeted in 2021 and it has not recovered. It's still really down. So a lot of the funds that, that we work with are talking about, you know, they've never seen opportunities like this. They've never, they have very little competition uh, for borrows, they're getting paid uh, four and a half, five percent on their short book. That's a great way to start off the year. If you're long 100 and short 70, and that's 70 percent, you're earning four and a half percent. That's nice. But to, to, you know, that didn't exist three, four, five, ten years ago. Great, great. So I want to just sort of change directions here a little bit. And I want to remind everybody, nobody is advising anybody up here. So. <laughs> <laughs> but should family offices be bullish, bearish, or neutral in hedge funds? And I think we've already sort of answered that question, but I, I want to go on further. Well, what do they need to do internally to really start investing in hedge funds properly? I mean... <laughs> I mean, there are several ways to do that. But, but, no, cool. Well, I mean, I, I think that, um, I mean, that's a very broad question. So I was just going to to pin it down to kind of what I do. Uh, I, I really like to get to know the managers. 
um, personally, uh, which takes time. And not everybody can do that, I know. But I think you can find vehicles of a way to access hedge funds. It could be a fund of funds. It could be through your broker platform. Uh, there's a number of ways to do it. And they, and they do levels of due diligence. But I think that's really important to, to read their letters and write, some of them write beautiful quarterly letters. And I, that they spend a lot of time putting those together. And I think you yeah. can really learn a lot about a manager by reading those letters, comparing that to their audit, looking back at past letters, see how they communicated difficult times, see how they, you know, things that didn't work. Um, you know, if the manager can't do that, then I kind of want to run the other way. But it's very good to, to find people that are very, very open and willing to talk about it. Their business, like, you know. We mentioned fund the funds. So that's, you know, another way where if you're not equipped to do the proper due diligence or your advisor or even your RA, you know, these kind of funds, that, that is their job, right? Is to, you know, look at hundreds of thousands of funds a year and decide which ones they think are going to be the winners. So, but, you know, you have to do your proper due diligence. You have to read the letters. And I think you have to be careful. You know, there are a lot of strategies out there that are very high octane and you know, 30, 40 percent standard deviation. They're not putting things hard. But, you know, if you want the type of returns you're looking for, you know, this is 5, 10 percent of your portfolio. This is not, you know, we're putting a whole retirement in the college savings plan. Again, I mean, you can have risky high octane funds or you can have. Um, you know, more stay rich, you know, what I call stay rich funds um, in your portfolio that all fund, fall under the umbrella of hedge funds. I mean, I think if you can do your own due diligence and you feel like you're qualified to do it, I think what Mitch said in terms of getting to the manager, reading the letters, you know, really understanding what the underlying strategy is. I think managers communicating when times are bad is more important than when times are good. I mean, I remember in August of 07 when the quant quake happened, Izzy Englander was down like 80 basis points. He called every client personally. And he had guys being like, I've got problems. You're not one of them. Why are you calling me? It's like, cause I haven't had a down month in three years. And you know, now's the time I'm supposed to be calling you. Um, so I think that's good. I think in terms of bank platforms, I think you need to understand again, there's a self selection bias there because most banks want the managers to pay them for being on their platform. And a lot of managers will say, not doing that, sorry. So if you're going through a bank, you may not be getting access to the best of the best. You might be getting access to managers that I would consider having some bias towards reversion to the mean. So, you know, again, but, but, but in all investing, know what you don't know, right? And be willing to say, listen, this is not, if you don't understand something, keep walking. That's, you know, my advice, because, you know, if, 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 if after an hour of sitting with a manager, you still don't understand what they're doing, they're either really lousy at explaining it, which is a problem in and of itself, or you don't understand it, which means you shouldn't be there because you're not going to understand if and when something goes wrong. And, you know, and that's the other thing, you can't buy it and forget it, even with these managers. I mean, um, so you really have to maintain the relationship, stay on top of what these guys are doing, making sure there's not style drift. You know, um, I, it takes a lot of work. So if you don't have the capacity to do the work, you should be working with an advisor or a fund of funds. But again, you have to do the work on the person that's making the decisions for you. And, and part of the algebra is, you know, strategies, you know, great returns last year, great returns the year before, doesn't mean great returns in the coming market. So part of the algebra is, you know, saying, okay, here are the returns they achieve. Here's the market today. And certainly today's market's unlike any other. Um, how do you, how do you do that? How do you, in your mind, how do you make that assessment? How do you come to comfort? I think it's one of the hardest things we have to do as allocators to managers is figuring out whether a manager is lucky or truly skilled. I mean, what the SEC makes managers put on the front of their documents, past performance is not a good indicator of future results, is sadly in this business true which isn't true for a lot of businesses, right? If you're a good widget maker today, unless your plant breaks down, you're probably a good widget maker tomorrow. But that doesn't, that's not true for investment managers because markets change, their style drift, guy's getting divorced, he's distracted, or the girl's getting divorced, I don't mean to, you know, or his kid's sick, 
or, you know, there's, there's all these factors that, that enter into the psyche of a manager. And again, it's why you, why, why you have to stay close, but there are metrics you can use. So some of the things that I like to think about is how many decisions is the manager making? Is he making 10 decisions and he's right eight out of 10 times, or is he making a hundred decisions and he's right 80 out of a hundred? What's more meaningful to me, 80 out of a hundred, right? Mm -hmm. So you start creating, you know, matrices where you evaluate managers based on those matrices. And so, and, and, you know, have they been consistent? What is their process? I always tell managers when I meet with them, if a manager has his performance on the first page of the deck, I, they lose me, right? Because the performance is an output. Right? What's your process? Is your process repeatable and sustainable? Is it repeatable and sustainable through market cycles? How do you adjust it for differences in market cycles? Um, you know, these are the kinds of questions that you need to be asking. The Sorry. turnover of the portfolio, the turnover of the managers, you know, all you have to do the proper due diligence. And as to her point, if you can't do it, you should rely on a professional account. It's about five minutes. What's that? Five minutes left. Okay. We're and and the other thing I'm going to stretch that into 20. The operational due diligence <laughs> piece of it <laughs> is right. also very important. Right. You know, and that's that's a business that didn't exist sort of pre made off. But I, I also love finding managers that are a certain age. You know, I find that managers that are in the high 30s to the mid 50s are in their sweet spot. And I find that there's some wealth effect that kicks in somewhere along the way. Sometimes it can kick in at age 50. Sometimes it kicks in at age 60 or 65, where the manager's thinking about his next vacation and where he's going to go and what he's going to do. That's when I'm out. I'm like, okay, I, I'm you know, I agree there. with you to an extent, Mitch, but I would argue that it depends on the manager. I mean, I remember yes. when I went to work for a family office and, you know, we went to go visit David Tepper. And we were day one investors with Tupper. And I'm thinking, I'm going to go out there. This guy's going to be a big swinging dick asshole who's worth a billion. Who's worth a billion dollars. No, many and he's, you know, he's he's a friend of mine. He's like, no, I'm like, wait, wait, let me finish this. And I'm going to have to spend the whole car ride back with my new boss telling him why I want to fire this guy who's made us so much money. Get to David's office. His sleeves are rolled up. He's got spreadsheets on his desk. He's worth a billion dollars. He's as engaged no, he's as like, you anyone you want. Fact. So it depends. There are certain managers who get wealthy and start taking less risk because they have more of their own money in the fund and they can make money on the management fees. And yes, you have to be cognizant of that. But just because a guy's become successful doesn't mean no, no, he isn't hungry. I mean, I Alan cash. Patrickoff, who's you know 89 years old, started his third venture capital fund at 86 and goes to work every day and was the oldest person to ever finish the New York Marathon. So I think you have to evaluate the, per <laughs> the, the person, you know, not, not their net worth. Yeah, you got to really get down and, and understand the person and what drives that person. Some people, it's just pride, right? I'm going to start a fund and there's no way I'm going to come out with that. Or they have numbers. no hobbies. Right? We had a lot of conversations with Harvard back in the day. Yeah. And they said they like to pick managers who are alumni yeah. and 29 years old. Because <laughs> <laughs> it gives them a lot of times at bat and they're going to write nice checks. They're going to get their kids into the school, build a building if they're super successful. I want to like go we back talking about to yesterday about no regrets. And he was interviewing a guy and he said, that, I just want to know if you're still hungry. He goes, I will pick you up and body slam you on this desk. You want to see if I'm still hungry? Uh, 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 That's funny. We're back to WWE. What can I say? <laughs> Cage man. Do we have any uh, questions from the audience here? Or? Yeah, I have a question about differentiation through due diligence, especially in the environment where money has not become as easy as it was and taking the biotech example. You know, money started to shift away from biotech to <coughs> med tech, where faster returns are present. But now we have a big boom of biotechs coming. So, how does due diligence change? For me, I, I, I think biotech is a really interesting space right now. It has yes, been, but I think finding a manager that I look for is a manager that can really hedge, and they're hedging skills. And do they have those skills? And where do they learn those? And how do they use those? And, and then you can look back at their track record and say, you know, wow, this manager with biotech dropped 50% basically almost two years in a row. They were making 25% a year, both years. I mean, that's pretty, pretty impressive. And, they, and then they're able to, when this thing comes out, they're able to also take advantage of that. You know, we just raised the largest European med tech fund in Switzerland. And, you know, they were a biotech, went med tech. I bet they're wishing they're still biotech. But the point is that they stayed the course and they know what they know and they know what they're experts in. And I think, you know, if someone's chasing shiny objects and going after strategies just because it's the hot strategy, then 
you want to be careful of those. Yeah, for me, it always comes back to the jockey, right? Like, I mean, I might decide that biotech's an interesting area and I want exposure to it, but then I'm looking for the guy that I think is going to ride the horse, you know, in the best way possible. And, you know, again, has that repeatable, sustainable process. Um, and, and I agree, you know, you know, it's, it's hard in biotech in particular to find guys who are good on the short side. I actually have someone I'll tell you about that. Oh, I got a great guy. I got a great guy. I got guy. one for you. You gotta have a guy. But anyway, that's. We have another question from the audience. I would take you as a manager over a swinging deck any day of the week. <laughs> <laughs> that is laid of all kinds of problems. <laughs> <laughs> Where we're going? Yeah, that's all. That's great. That's Wait, right. sure we warned HR you were going to be WWE. I think HR is going to come down pretty quick. <laughs> Um, I'm the girl, so I can say that. Yeah, there you, go. There you, go. <laughs> you, you guys, you guys can. Um, I got three actually, daughters. Wait a second. This is this is actually a great you conversation. I and I like to continue it once you're coming to dinner. So we'll talk about it at dinner time. Um, but I think it's super interesting where we are right now. I think there's a lot of opportunities and, and some, um, <coughs> you know, uh, possibilities that have been around for a while. Any thoughts? Have you talked about AI already? We haven't touched on AI at all. In fact, the whole that's the last question of the day. What's the impact of AI on the profession and on the space, et cetera? I mean, I hear some of the managers that we work with talking about using AI. I would be personally very concerned if I felt like I had a manager that was relying on it. I think it's a tool. I think it's an interesting tool. Um, I think there are dangers associated with it. I mean, I, you know, not on the topic of hedgements, but I was just having this conversation with uh, the outsourced CIO we use in, in the family office about third-party wires, right? Because you could call me to confirm a wire and you could have some AI chatbot that sounds like me, looks like me. Uh, I was at a conference recently where there was a woman who, um, very visionary in terms of technology, and she said somebody brought her a deal that the technology can create a virtual you. So that's like your persona on the web. And she's like, I haven't tweeted about it. I haven't talked about it because I think it's dangerous. Like you think, I mean, I have an almost 12 year old girl, like Snapchat, TikTok, like it's all a disaster, but can you imagine the disaster it would be if they had like an AI person doing it for them? Next level disaster. So it's, 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 I think it's scary, but I do think that for managers sifting through lots of data, it can be a valuable tool. It just has to be treated with caution. And I'll just say I specifically, but technology, you know, we're using technology to kind of weed out the people it's not appropriate to invest in, educate the consumer, you know, fill out the paperwork, the KYC, the AML, the compliance, the capital reporting distribution, all the worst part of raising money or managing money using technology to help do it just makes it more efficient. Um, and, and it gives opportunities to people that normally didn't have it. Absolutely. Yeah, but still, I want people, I want manual, well, I, you know, I was checks. just going to say, I think if AI is definitely a theme through several of these hedge funds. Uh, they're looking for where the winners are going to be and the losers, and there's going to be plenty on both sides. Um, and that's, that's a major I have a major follow -up question. Here. So, and I, the follow-up question is, you're using AI as a tool or as... Oh. Or, or, or as a decision maker for them. But how do you assess that, right? How do you assess how good that AI is as you're going in? I wouldn't invest with a manager who's invest, using I AI to make a decision. Uh -huh. It's a tool. They're using it as a tool to, you know, maybe there's a conference calls they want to listen to and they want to, they can listen to the notes, you know, one I conference call, you read them, and then they can go back and listen to it if they want. I mean, they're just using it to, Make themselves more productive internally. Or just can't, you need a physical person to make the ultimate decision. You know, uh, I mean, all... I, listen, if you're investing in quant, you're going to have, you know, systems making decisions. I tend not to invest in, I don't like quant because I don't, un, again, going back to, you don't understand it, keep walking, right? I, models break, in my opinion. And you, they work until they don't. Be able to compress all this economic data, right? And help drive decisions that are good picks and help you do, do that work that you're trying to get more efficient yeah, on. And, and look a bit full. Yeah. Very last question. Yeah. No longer so, than 15 so second response. On the topic of AI and uh, investing. So it seems like there's every single day there's new technology better technology, greater technology, et cetera, et cetera. 
and it's certainly going to be some kind of washout at some point. And I think to me, that's an interesting question about investing in AI, not so much using the AI as the tool, but investing in AI and how much are, are the funds putting into that? The AI is going to tell you which AI to invest in. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm going to table that one, but the right. last question. A carbon, the new, you know, commodity in the marketplace. Do you see that in the hedge fund space? We, we don't do a lot in the energy space. Carbon we like commodities. The, we don't like the volatility of the commodity. <clears throat> but, How about Daniel? Yeah. 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 Energy yeah. focus. Intent. I, I, sorry. Data analytics. Data analytics. Talk offline. I that, there's no more questions here. So yeah, the last question is data analytics. The real last question. What, what data about analytics, data, data analytics, you know, for, for, oh, for marketing purposes, you know, like um, intent data, for example, that like companies like D&D and Zoom Info are using. Do you, do you guys get involved in any of that? I'm sure that we have, I have managers that look at it, but I'm not, not as a broad theme. The data is probably the most valuable thing you have because then you know who to go after to what to invest in or who to invest in data. So data is important, but time, you know, saving time is the other most important thing as well. Great job. Thank you.